And we want to welcome you this morning to Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School. And um, we're going to be, uh, our speaker today is going to be Ron Graybill, who's part of our group, <coughs> but Ron is a California and been at the White Estate for several years. And so uh, in a few moments, we'll have uh, Ron speak to us. Uh, I understand Bailey Gillespie's funeral this afternoon. What time and where? Four. At? La Sierra University Church. Church, okay. And so uh, Bailey Gillespie passed away four o'clock this afternoon. And I'm happy to comment that Ron Graybill is not dead. I guess somehow or another the word got back to uh, the other Roy Branson legacy Sabbath school at Sligo that that uh, Ron had died with lung cancer. So, uh, <laughs> And as Mark Twain said, uh, rumors of his death are greatly exaggerated. So we do have Ron here with us today. So, um, Anyway, so at this time, I'm just going to turn it over to Ron. Ron, you've got some announcements uh, that you want to comment on, and then do your presentation, and then we'll have question and answer. Let's have a, a prayer. Lord, thank you for this Sabbath day, and bless us as we look at some of the ways that uh, artists have depicted your servants over the years and uh, guide us in our discussion and throughout the day. In Christ's name, amen. Um, my uh, presentation is not, uh, will not occupy the whole 30 minutes, so I thought, well, I have an opportunity then to make some announcements about some forthcoming books. Since my topics are usually uh, Adventist history, these books have to do with Adventist history. For uh, uh, sometime in the future, Terry Amont is going to be publishing the biography of Ellen G. White as part of the Pioneer Adventist Pioneer series, you know, there's a whole series of books, and uh, this will be an excellent uh, biography of Ellen White. John Butler is also working on a biography of Ellen White, uh, uh, but John crafts his prose so carefully that it may be even longer before John's um, work appears. Um, the Pacific Press has just announced uh, two new books on the last generation theology, one by uh, George Knight, In Time Events in the Last Generation, and another by uh, a group of seminary professors, God's Character in the Last Generation. And uh, we also have uh, Professor uh, Brunsma, his book is coming out, In All Humility, Saying No to the Last Generation. So uh, those books are uh, on the way. These, the first two are already there. Now, I was going to have this class next week, too, to talk about the great controversy over the great hope. But when I started into this research, I discovered that it was so vast that I couldn't possibly encompass the topic. This little pamphlet is a condensation of the great controversy that has been distributed by the millions around the world. And uh, this has so offended the fanatic fringe of the church uh, that uh, Poor Ted Wilson is attacked more violently from the right than he is from the left. <coughs> and I understand that uh, uh, Chuck Scriven has an, a strong editorial coming out in Spectrum about Ted Wilson, so uh, Ted can feel warm from both sides. Uh, but it's outrageous. These people have called this a fraud and a hoax because it leaves out the investigative judgment, it leaves out the most strident condemnations of the Catholic Church and all of this stuff. Oh, we're just hiding our light by passing out this fraudulent book. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep studying the, this, uh, this uh, fanatic fringe of the church because they're engaged in a lot of other criticisms of the church. You know, I, I thought our church was getting all the heat from the left. I had no idea. Just go on YouTube and, and, and search for 
the great hope versus the great controversy. And oh, they go on and on about, about this terrible, terrible uh, book. And uh, what, how Ted Wilson was such a fraud by putting out this, uh, this uh, boulderized edition. But our topic for today is Tolstoy's Orphan, the story of Peter Plotkin and other portraits. And um, so if we can out in the lights, as the Pennsylvania Dutch say, we will proceed. Um, yes, indeed. Okay, here we go. In 1881, the Tsar Alexander II of Russia was assassinated. A revolutionary threw a bomb under his carriage. It uh, injured the horses and the coachman and uh, some bystanders. And the Tsar stepped out of his bulletproof, bomb-proof carriage to see what was going on. A second revolutionary threw another bomb at his feet, which mortally maimed and wounded him. He was carried to the, to the palace, but he died within a few hours. His son, um, Alexander III, took over. And he had earlier married Princess Dalmar of Denmark. Their son became Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, who was uh, murdered along with his whole family in 1918. Now, Princess Dalmar, of course, converted to uh, the uh, Russian Orthodox <coughs> religion. And the couple had a... Um, church, a Russian Orthodox church, built in Copenhagen, which was already there when Ellen White visited in uh, 1885. And looking out her window, she said, a little to the right is the glistening dome of a Rus Russian Orthodox church. This dome, we are told, is overlaid with gold. Now, the assassin of Alexander III was not Jewish. But, in his uh, little terrorist cell, there, wa there was at least one Jewish person. And the result was that Jews in Russia suffered four years of pogroms. And in 1884, the parents of five-year-old Peter Plotkin were murdered in a pogrom. Now, the Baron Horace Gunsberg, the only Jewish baron in Russia, a wealthy banker and railroad uh, magnate, adopted little Peter Plotkin. He was good friends with Leo Tolstoy. And this was happening about the time that Leo Tolstoy experienced his Christian conversion, his form of Christianity. And he was trying to help poor people. It is said that Tolstoy mentored young Peter Plotkin and actually helped him uh, with his education, sent him to the Royal Russian University where he studied art, and on his paintings he always signs his name with that RRU designation. Now, uh, Plotkin, either before he immigrated to America or afterwards, Plotkin converted from the, Jew, uh, from the Jewish religion to the Christian religion. And uh, we're not sure when that happened, but he ended up in Texas and later in California, where his family still has uh, a, a gallery displaying his paintings down in uh, Lake Forest, California. And... Um, Some of Plotkin's paintings, uh, including George Washington as a mason. Um, when he settled first in Texas, and while there, he painted a portrait of Lottie Moon, the famous Baptist missionary to China. And on the scroll beneath her hand there, you will have the, uh, let me see if this works, yes. You have in Hebrew, uh, a translation of the New Testament text, 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now later we're going to see a portrait of Ellen White, which is <laughs> in some ways very similar to this one. Now, this man, F.C. Gilbert, was attracted by the notice that a Jewish Christian artist was in America. F.C. Gilbert was a Seventh-day Adventist whose life mission was to convert Jews to Christianity and to Seventh-day Adventism. So when he heard that Peter Plotkin had gone to Pasadena to live, he got in touch with uh, P.T. McGann, and uh, he suggested that McGann hire Plotkin for a painting of Ellen White to grace his newly completed 1937 White Memorial Hospital. Prior to this, White Memorial had been all single-story frame buildings, but this was the big advance at White Memorial. And this hospital was actually designed by a famous uh, Southern California ar architect, Myron Hunt. Hunt also designed the Rose Bowl and the Huntington, uh, Henry Huntington's mansion at the Huntington Library and Gardens, where they now have the, um, the, the classic art, art museum. So anyway, um, Plotkin was hired, and he created this painting of Ellen White. And again, we have a scroll. This time, of course, it also has Hebrew, but this time it's the Sabbath commandment that Plotkin has added. Now, Plotkin also came to the White and taught art classes to the doctors and the nurses, and some of the notes and sketches that he used in that class are actually in the library here at Loma Linda in their, in their uh, historical collections. He also painted two pictures of Loma Linda luminaries, P.T. McGann and um, Newton Evans. These hang <coughs> high up on the wall in the faculty reading room, you know, which is connected to the library. And if you look carefully at uh, Newton Evans' portrait, you will discover in the corner that you can see Peter Plotkin's uh, signature. Now, Plotkin, like many other artists, modeled his painting of Ellen White after the, an 1899 photograph of Ellen White that was made in Australia. And notice the, 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 lace, the white lace uh, collar on Mrs. White here. It appears also on her in this sculpture by Victor Issa, which is up on the hill be, behind Nickel Hall. Um, there you see it. Now, this uh, group is called This is the Very Place. And there is this uh, legend based on Henry Burton's, or not Henry Burton, John Burton's uh, memory, that Mrs. White, when she saw this hill, she said, this is the very place that I've seen in vision where we should have our hospital. Now, frankly, I doubt that she ever said that, because if she had noticed that, she certainly would have mentioned that in one of her writings. Not only that, but the Mormons beg to differ. They say this is the place on Temple Square in Salt Lake City. So you have the Mormon prophet versus the Adventist prophet, each claiming, this is the place. Okay, well, one is for Adventists and one is for Mormons. I think uh, Victor Ice's um, bust of Ellen White is the, the, probably the best one that's ever been created. Certainly much better than the other one, which is hidden away in the storage room of the Heritage Research Center. This bus was done some years ago, and when Grace Jocks, Ellen White's granddaughter, saw it, she was so horrified that she demanded that they not show it to anyone. But they brought it out for me, and I have documented it and brought it here <laughs> so you can see it. This uh, 
photograph is so popular that even Ron Numbers used it on the cover of his book, Prophetess of Health. Another photograph that is often rendered in paintings is this one of Ellen White with her eyes looking up to heaven. Now, it's interesting that when artists copy this photograph, they often bring her eyes down a little bit. If you look carefully, you'll see that you can see more of the whites of her eyes here than you do here. Now, another thing about this painting on the left is you will notice that Ellen White is holding a large quill pin, whereas in the original photograph, it's just probably just a pencil. She was not using quill pins at this period of her life, if she ever did. But artists seem to love that quill pin, so they bring it in. Mrs. White actually had this pose, did, uh, made this pose on a couple of occasions at least, and uh, perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps in one place the photographer may have suggested that she look up to heaven. But anyway, you can see the chair is different here, and the, here she has the bow, and here she doesn't. So. She saw that once and thought, well, that's a nice way to do it. I'm going to do that that way again. Because unlike ordinary women who have to rack their brains to figure out what to write, Ellen White could look to heaven for inspiration. When Russ Harlan um, rendered that painting, he again brought her eyes down a little bit. And when Harry um, Ask, I think his name is, or Harry On, he painted this, and there's a copy of this one. There's a copy of this one on the right at Elmshaven in California and at Andrews University. And he gives her a, uh, a uh, dip pen in the inkwell, which is uh, very typical. But Notice her eyes in his painting. She's looking pretty much straight ahead. Now, other artists uh, try to uh, uh, glamorize uh, Ellen White a little bit. Um, but in doing so, they violate other historical standards. For instance, Ellen White never would have worn a dress as elegant and fancy and, as the one on the left. And she never would have worn a dress in colors as loud as the one on the right. You would think that these artists painted this this morning, inspired by the gaudy colors at the wedding in Great Britain. <coughs> See that people coming in like flaming yellow and orange, and my goodness, did you think you were going to the Kentucky Derby or something? Perhaps the thought that you might end up behind one of those hats and not be able to see anything. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Mrs. White always used plain uh, dark clothing. And in fact, she, she criticized Fanny Bolton one time when Fanny Bolton was wearing a dress with large uh, floral prints on it. You know, most of us, uh, when we choose a photograph for our Facebook profile, choose one that uh, that we like, that looks most like we would like to look like. Uh, but if you look at all the photographs that you've seen of yourself, you realize they're not all flattering. And so when artists chose photographs of Ellen White to copy, they tended to choose the nicest ones. And the two most frequently copied were those two. Now, uh, other paintings of Ellen White tend to glamorize her a bit, not, not too much, but um, they even out her features a bit and, uh, and, uh, and uh, bring her eyes down, although here we have, on the, on the right, we have her eyes up to heaven a little bit. And then there are actresses who've played her in various videos and movies. Uh, this one is from many years ago. Quite a nice looking woman. And uh, here's another one from another video. Uh, this one looked more like Ellen White than any of the others I've seen. And then the most recent one here, again, um, a little bit more glamorous than Ellen was, but still uh, 
trying to have something, uh, some air of authenticity to it. Now, one of the most interesting <coughs> genres of Ellen White paintings is the ones that claim that she actually predicted the destruction of the ten Twin Towers on, in, uh, in uh, 2001. And let's read the passage that leads people to say this. When in New York City in the night season, I beheld buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof. As these lofty buildings went up, the owners rejoiced with ambitious pride that they had money to use in gratifying self and provoking the envy of their neighbors. Much of the money that they thus invested had been obtained through exaction, through grinding down the poor. When I saw that passage, I thought, well, maybe she did know about <laughs> certain people. Um, this scene, the, the scene that passed before me was an alarm of fire. These buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. Now, the White Estate has actually put out a statement saying that Ellen White did not predict 9-11. But you can see how people would be tempted to, to say so. And uh, the, the Standish brothers go one better. In this book, he has a passage that reads, Americans use the shorthand 9-11 to refer to the events of September 11, 2001. It is uncanny that Sister White's prophecy concerning this event commences in volume 9 on page 11. There you go. Doesn't that prove it? My goodness. Absolutely. So we have pictures of Ellen White. This is probably one of the glummest pictures of her uh, and the, the Twin Towers. The passage I read to you was actually on 12 and 13, but uh, Standish had to find it the 11, so he went back to the beginning. And then um, this one, uh, notice the, um, it's, it's almost as though you have the devil depicted in the flames up here. <coughs> now, this one on the right is actually uh, kind of inspired by a Harry Anderson uh, painting of the saints on their way to heaven. One which I've always considered rather grotesque with her neck stretched up like that. But anyway, that was what this fellow copied. Now, almost immediately after 9-11, Southwestern Adventist University launched the Gift of Prophecy Art Contest. And the deadline was exactly six months after the Twin Tower attack. As you might expect, the winning entry was Ellen White's 9-11 <coughs> vision. I rather prefer an 11-year-old child's version in the Grandma Moses style. Um, and there's some other entries to this contest that I find intriguing. Um, you, as you know, Alfred Lee painted this uh, beautiful mural of uh, Ellen White's first vision with the saints uh, on their way to heaven. And Jesus is the large feature in the middle. Ellen White is the biggest human fig fi fi figure over on the left, but Jesus is in the middle. Now, here's Alfred actually working on it. And in the original painting, he did show a few folks falling off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Uh, if we zoomed in closely, we would see Neil Wilson and our own uh, Bill Johnson and uh, some others recognizable on the path. They have not fallen off yet, although if Alfred did it today, maybe some would want him to put Bill uh, off the path. I don't know. Um, so anyway, uh, that was the way Alfred Lee depicted that. Now, in the art contest, a child <clears throat> looked at a, a later vision of the saints marching to heaven, 
uh, it's a 1968 vision. And notice that here, it's not Jesus that presides over our march to heaven, but Ellen White. And whereas Alfred Lee didn't really show us the dark and working world below, this youngster really wanted us to see that. Uh, you, you can't see all of it, but down here there's a, there's a couple dancing. And uh, what Ellen White says, uh, let's see here, the sounds of mirth and revelry, the profane oath, the vulgar jest, the low, vile songs, loud laughter mingled with cursing and cries of anguish and bitter wailing. That's what came up from the, from the abyss below. And of course the child is uh, impressed by that and, and uh, shows the, uh, the wicked here reveling. Now, one of the best portraits of Ellen White, I think, is this one by Doug Hackleman. And he has glamorized Ellen White just a bit by giving her uh, a diamond in her brooch and blue eyes. There is no other painting of Ellen White that gives her blue eyes. I don't think she had blue eyes. I've never heard of that. But uh, Doug <coughs> gave her blue eyes. Um, years ago, Alfred Lee depicted her in her writing room at Elmshaven in the Napa Valley. And then we have some cartoon renditions of Ellen White. Uh, here we go, thoroughly glamorized um, by this uh, young woman from Mexico, or somewhere uh, in uh, Latin America, who, uh, you know, thins her lips and uh, really gives her a glamorous treatment. Now, there's one more, and I never, I don't know where this came from or where it's going, but let's look at it. Somebody seems to be working on an animated video, and uh, it'd be interesting if that ever comes out. Anyway, up in the library here at Loma Linda, we have uh, this uh, picture of Ellen White, again, following the, uh, the uh, 1899 Photograph. Now, can anybody recognize the building that's depicted in this? The White. It's the White, yeah. yeah the White. It's that 1937 White Memorial. So he put, the artist puts Ellen White with the White Memorial. It's interesting that they chose to name it White Memorial Hospital. After all, they needed a hospital in the city because out here in Loma Linda, you had all these cow pastures and orange groves and you didn't have enough patients for the medical students to get any kind of clinical training. And medical schools all over the country were linking up with county hospitals so that they could train these young doctors uh, on actual patients. First I thought that was, it wasn't that generous of these medical schools to, to, to work with the county hospitals, to work with the poor. Well, maybe a little bit, but more likely it was the people in the county hospitals couldn't object to all these young whippersnappers coming in and pawing over them, whereas the paying patients didn't want that. So anyway, Loma Linda started the White Memorial, affiliated with L.A. County Hospital, and has been there ever since. Now, I own only one original art piece of Ellen White, and it is a parody of Grant Wood's famous American Gothic. I hesitate to show it to you, but it was given me as a gift when I graduated from Johns Hopkins, and here I am. Here I am. So with that, we'll conclude. Oh, we're in good time. We'll conclude um, that portion, and we can have the lights back on, and we can find out what you folks have seen as you've looked at these pictures, or any questions that you might want to ask. Comments or observations? You may have seen things that I missed. I saw some pictures of her writing with the left hand and some of the right, uh, right, left hand, right hand, both, both uh, rendition. Is that 
she's a right-handed person or a left-handed person? You know what I think is that somewhere in the process the photograph has gotten flipped. Uh, I'm pretty sure she was right-handed. Uh, we should look at the actual, well, we, we, I should say we should look at the original photographs, but what we have is photographs of the photographs, so we may have flipped them before that. Yeah, no, I think she was right-handed. Anyway, she was not ambidextrous as far as I know. She had many gifts, but not that one. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. In some of those pictures, it reminds me of a story I heard that she wore a brooch but they later airbrushed it out? Is that an accurate No, I don't, think they, I don't think they've airbrushed the brooch out, but there's a picture, um, uh, she did have various brooches at different times, and... Uh, but they didn't touch the skin, so it's okay. Is that well, right? maybe, maybe that, but, but there was a picture of the, the Elmshaven group, and when she was uh, in Australia or in Hawaii or somebody, somebody gave her a, not her, but her daughter-in-law, gave her um, a lei, a, a, a seashell, a seashell lei or necklace, you know what I mean? Could have been the flowers, but it was of seashells. And so she is wearing that in this picture sitting next to Ellen White. And there, early on, there were people who airbrushed the, the, that, that out. Well, this is not a very controversial, well, here we go. <laughs> You ended the story of Potkin uh, at uh, the at Wharton World teaching classes. Uh, what what was his long term relationship with the Adventist Church? You know, I don't think that Potkin had any sustained relationship with the Adventist Church, and he didn't fulfill F. C. Gilbert's dream that he might become a Seventh Day Adventist. But he did. He did teach that class. I think he may have taught a class here at Loma Linda as well, but you know, he, he did that, and uh, I don't know of any, any further. Go ahead. Oh, I just have a simple question. I came in late, so I didn't see the beginning in all of the photographs. Uh, but I had a question that always I've wondered about. Did Ellen White wear a wedding ring when she was down in Australia? And, and uh, are those <coughs> in any of the photos? Or any evidence one way or the other? Well, by the time she was in Australia, you know, her husband had died, but oh. Gilbert uh, Valentine is here. If, if she did wear a wedding ring in Australia, he would know, and I think he doesn't. <laughs> what do you think, Gil? Uh, I don't think she ever did. Uh, didn't wear one, but she was comfortable with her daughter-in-law wearing one for the wedding. Her daughter-in-law, May Lacey, um, was 19, 20 years younger than Willie, and May's father was absolutely sure that he didn't want his daughter running around Australia with an American man twice her age without some indication that they were married. Okay. So she was married with a wedding ring and Ellen White offered the prayer of blessing on her. Okay, so she blessed her wedding ring. We didn't know that here at Long Island. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, uh, it's interesting how Ellen White's uh, uh, clothing and uh, uh, changed over the years and uh, she adapted to the changes uh, you know as the, in the 1890s these uh, these big puff sleeves were popular and they have pictures of her literary assistants with those big puff sleeves and if you look at Ellen White's garments her sleeves are in, in the 1890s are much uh, larger and of course we found that picture of her at the 1905 general conference session wearing a big Edwardian hat. And uh, I'm telling you, early on, uh, she was criticized because some people thought that the, the ribbons on her bonnet were too ostentation. So for a woman who had to wear a very demure bonnet to end up in an Edwardian hat is, a, you know, mile, mile, miles apart. Yeah. It, um is there any uh, record of how she wanted herself pictured? You know, the mother or the teacher or the prophet with the head up or the... Is there any evidence that she had a preference for how she liked her pictures to be recorded? 
Well, except for the fact that she had this one pose done a couple of times, at least a couple of times, um, I don't think so. It's interesting that um, in the mid-1870s, when there was so much tension between her and James, <coughs> and between uh, James and his son Edson, and when part of the family was off in Oakland, and part was in Battle Creek, and James wanted Ellen to come and be with him, and she said, no, I, I need to be out here going to camp meetings. And uh, she was careful to tell James that uh, uh, the church was crowded, and uh, people were delighted to show James that uh, she could get along without him, um, which he didn't think was possible. Um, but um, during that period of tension in the family, she seems to have had more photographs taken than at any other time. So apparently she was using these photographs to try and bind the family together and help them to remind, re, re, remember each other. But um, I don't know if there were, were, I don't know, Gil, do you remember, were there any paintings of her done during her lifetime? I don't, I'm not aware of any paintings. Or drawings? No. I don't think there was any artistic representation of her, other than photographs during her lifetime. I do recall that that the role of the photograph was important to, to, to him building a sense of community. And he referred to that in the 70s. Um, late 1860s, they, James organized for them to take photographs. I think they were going to put them, one in each of them, one in Life Sketches and, and one in James' own autobiography. <coughs> but James, be, ever being the, the entrepreneur, um, had multiple copies of it and was hawking, hawking them around the camp meetings, selling them in, in, uh, in big numbers. <laughs> and what happened was that others saw that that was a business opportunity too. So they made copies of them and were also selling them. Oh, um, <coughs> and, and it became a bit of a snowball. They didn't have and it ended up with some embarrassment and James made quite a profuse apology in the review for her, having started this nasty business money off of and, uh, commercializing uh, photographs. Uh, now, that reminds me, there, there was one, uh, at least one artistic rendition of James and Ellen, um, uh, it had been an, uh, an engraving, because there was this book published, uh, what was it called, Famous and Self-Made Men of Michigan? And there was an, uh, an article about Ellen White, an article about James White in that book, along with other famous Michiganders. And uh, there is an artistic representation of Ellen White in that book. So that would be, as far as I know, the only artistic representation made during her lifetime. They were very sensitive about their image, because when James was in California and Ellen White was touring, this is the time when things were a bit tense, they <laughs> sent copies of photos to each other because they were getting ready for publication and were quite unhappy with the photographer and actually sent a bunch of them back and told him to do them again. So they were very, very sensitive about the quality <coughs> of the image. Yeah. Okay, over here somewhere. Peter. Yeah, Peter. Uh, interesting presentation, Ron, and interesting associations that you made. Um, you titled your presentation uh, Tolstoy's Orphan. And I was thinking, why, why you titled it that way? And then I was thinking further, and, and the, the association that I made was that uh, uh, Count uh, Lev Tolstoy was an orphan. Uh, he was one of the five children of uh, uh, a Count family, and uh, he was uh, the four children. And when he was nine years old, uh, his father died. And maybe this is the association that yeah, we can make with uh, yeah. yes, uh, orphan. Then I'm uh, thinking to uh, the church that uh, the czars were building in Copenhagen. And I also re remember that uh, after the Bolsheviks, uh, they killed uh, Nicholas and Alexander. Alexandra and their children. Uh, the Tsarina, the mother of the Tsar, took <coughs> refuge in, in uh, Denmark. 
she passed away. I mean, the, the association between that church that they built there because they have some roots. Yeah, yeah. And the grandmother of Nicholas was, was basically of Danish origin. And uh, now, in regard to, to the paintings uh, of Plotkin, uh, it's uh, very interesting that the Russians do not have a Rembrandt or a Goya, or I mean, they didn't have great, extraordinary painters, but uh, they have good painters. They uh, were thinking uh, mostly of what they were painting, and uh, uh, Plotkin, as we see, he was painting a lot of portraits and also landscapes. Yeah. That is, is something characteristic for the Russian painters. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know about Tolstoy's uh, <coughs> being an orphan. And I must confess, as a historian, that I do wish that I could have found some independent <coughs> proof that Tolstoy had a connection to Plotkin. It's a family tradition. You know what I mean? And family traditions sometimes prove mm, not to be accurate. You know, uh, OK. Nothing profound. But I wish you'd put some pictures of Ellen and James together, uh, like over the years, uh, something. Just a, just a preference. I, I was going to ask you. I've seen paintings of the two together. Did they ever have any pictures together? But then my mind finally toggled that, yeah, I saw photographs sometime. But well, you, sir, uh, uh, I don't recall if there's one that just depicts James and Ellen. But of course, there are pictures of James and Ellen and uh, Edson and Willie. Yeah. That's a very that's a very fascinating period picture too because in 1864 they go to the photographer and they sit down and uh, the photographer uh, is uh, setting things up and so he finds a book and uh, he hands this book to James White to hold a symbol of authority and wisdom in the family. So he takes the picture and. Ellen White sees that picture, and the next year, they go back and have this same picture taken again. Now, this time, Ellen White is holding the book, and she's holding it very conspicuously. So we know that a little bit of wisdom and authority in this family, uh, on the part of the mother as well. Hold on just a second. Let me get the microphone up to you. Okay. By the way, is that... James White in the picture there. <laughs> there you go. You know, I, I, I almost went into Photoshop to put her behind the pitchfork and make me smaller. I, I, uh, I didn't uh, try that. Go ahead. A very earliest picture, I think, of James and Ellen. Oh, that's right. It's an 1857 daguerreotype, and that's just the two of them. Yeah, that's but true. But unfortunately, there's a major crack down the middle. Well, there's one of them that's not correct. Is that prophetic? It's yeah, there's, there's one of them. Yeah, there are two of those. Uh, those are ambrotypes. Ambrotypes. Uh, ambrotypes. They're the very earliest pictures of uh, Ellen, our, our James and Ellen together. Yes, that's true. Okay. I'm changing the focus just a little bit here. Uh, recently, when I think we were discussing this, part of this was about Tolstoy's anti-Semitism. And I think you were saying maybe that's not so... Rigid? Well, I was hoping, I was hoping, uh, I was thinking about introducing that, uh, that idea. Um, uh, during these pogroms, uh, Tolstoy did not protest the, the, po the pogroms. And some have blamed him because he was supposed to be such a moral man and so sympathetic to the poor and the outcasts and so on. But um, it's a... It was a very delicate situation. This Baron Gunsberg was uh, a leader in the Jewish community, and he was trying to get Jews to assimilate to Russian society. So he was himself not as critical of, of Russian society. He wanted uh, to get uh, Jews accepted, so maybe he didn't protest, and then and, and Tolstoy. Uh, didn't protest. I was I was hoping that we could find some pro-Jewish sentiment in Tolstoy to explain the, the thing, but maybe the orphan connection is more powerful. 
Well, uh, un hey, anti-Semitism. Hold on, Peter. Well, of course, uh, we know historically that the Jews were not very well treated by the Zans. Yeah. And uh, many of them were part of some uh, anarchist uh, organizations. They were part of also Bolshevik movements. Uh, Trotsky and others were part of, uh, part of these uh, movements and a very close association with, uh, with the Bolshevik, with the communist regime. But uh, he was uh, very interesting that uh, the Tsar was killed by the anarchists, but they were killing the Tsar that liberated the Serbs. I know, yeah. yeah. And his son was going to do more reforms. But right, he was called the liberator. Yeah. But they killed him. And I was thinking also of this picture that uh, you have there, and. Uh, I was, uh, I was thinking if you were uh, thinking a little bit about uh, uh, the, the Neptune with his trident that uh, was uh, calming the seas. Yeah, why not? <laughs> okay. Okay, well, I think, oh, Grant. Well, I'll just, oh. Uh. <coughs> I don't want to finish on a down thing at all, but I'm not a historian and I, I mean I've heard when Gil and yourself, we, we talk about this difficult time in <coughs> Ellen's life, Ellen and James, and um, uh, is there any succinct, could you give us just a little succinct summary about, um, did, did that have a, a an impact upon uh, the saints, was there any sort of crisis that came out of that? Was there a, a you know, a church crisis? How was it handled? You know, I'm sure they didn't have quite the same sophisticated PR systems they have now, but... You mean anything that came out of the conflict yeah, between Yeah, the conflict James between the two. Let's let Gil comment on that, but I, I, I want to uh, mention uh, that I failed to mention an important book this morning when I talked about forthcoming books because Gill's biography of Jane Andrews has it has did they did you get word did they actually accept it still waiting. huh still waiting. still waiting I thought they were going to do it yesterday <laughs> they may have but I haven't heard yet yeah, he hasn't heard yet the, the Pacific Press was supposed to approve his biography of Jane Andrews and I'll tell you that biography will tell you a lot of things about uh, James White that we haven't okay. known before. But what would you say? Did, did the conflict between James and Ellen in the 60s, uh, 70s, in the 70s, did it have an impact on the church? Terry might know more than I do on this, but I, I'm not aware that it surfaced to such a level that it was known beyond the inner circle. Uh, okay. It was known to the family and it was known to the leadership that they were travelling separately and the reason for the travelling separately, but I, I'm not sure that it was known widely beyond that. Um, Terry might know. Terry told us yesterday, or Thursday, about a statement that Ellen White had made later in her life that she was still married to James long after he was <coughs> dead. Um, and that was new to me. Um, well, let's, we still got nine minutes. Let's let Terry comment on the, the marriage of James and Ellen White. Um, Terry Amont, you know, is uh, from Wawa, and uh, we're urging her to hasten her biography of Ellen White, because we think that'll be the last we have a woman writing about a woman. Okay. Well, there were uh, a couple of major crises uh, between James and Ellen in 1874 and 1876. And, of course, uh, some of those details came out in the Lucinda <coughs> Hall correspondence, which wasn't known until quite a bit later um, when those, that collection of letters was discovered. But there were other letters uh, to, to James 
And James was writing to her, but none of those letters survived from that period, which suggests to me that um, Alan destroyed them. Uh, James was a bit paranoid and accused her of various things and said, I think, some unfortunate things. And then she, her letters survived, and so we see her responding to those points, but you have to infer some of the things that he was saying. But that was private, that was a family matter. Certainly it was not something, people were aware that James's health was not good, and so that was a reason why he would not be traveling with her uh, at certain times. And other times he wanted to travel, she wanted to write, and he would uh, really push her uh, to come, to leave that aside and come and travel, preach with him. But it, it was complicated, very complicated. And then it was in 1906 when she was being interviewed that she said, yes, I married James White in 1846, and we've been married ever since. And he had been dead for 25 years. Um, now, she's correct that James's letters were lost, but she should have mentioned that Ellen White quotes James in her letters. In fact, my use of the Lucinda Hall letters in my doctoral dissertation is one of the reasons why I was asked to leave the White Estate, because at those, in those days those weren't released, you know. But uh, she quotes James as writing to her and saying, um, <coughs> keep your head on your own shoulders. I have one of my own, or something like that, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, so she was uh, obviously hurt and offended by this, but um, she, uh, it was at that time when she asked his forgiveness and said, you know, I don't claim perfection of Christian character. I often have to kneel at the feet of Jesus for my own sins and so on. And so she was trying to reconcile with James. And on that positive note, we'll... Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I to put this microphone down to applaud. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I have uh, an announcement from our, uh, yeah, David. <laughs> uh, he will be presenting next week. And he said the title will be Do True Adventists Believe That Everything Is Getting Worse and Worse? So uh, David will be making that presentation. And um, tonight uh, at the University of Redlands, the uh, Redlands Symphony, Symphony. I don't say, I want to say it's a sympathy, but it's a symphony, and it's a great orchestra. And there are two tickets that I have. They're in the front row. So, uh, if you are interested in good music, uh, we have a couple tickets donated by Donna. And so, um, actually, they're <coughs> going to Nanette, which is given to me. Oh, so you're re gifting them. <laughs> 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 very good seats. Okay. And then they are very good seats, yeah. So, uh, uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, so, uh, again, next week, instead of having uh, Ron, we're going to have David, and it should be a very uh, interesting issue. Of, are things getting worse and worse? And so, at this time, um, let's do our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Um, see me if you are interested in tickets.